Hello everyone, my name is Luc Duchesne. I am the Head of Brand Marketing at Behavior Interactive here in Montreal. It's a pleasure to be here with you today, even though it's a little bit weird to be in this setup and not being with you all like in a physical place, but maybe next year this will be possible. Just that you know, after my talk, I will be able to answer questions so you can go on Pine and ask your questions. During the presentation, I do not have access to it because I will focus entirely on what I'm about to say. So. I'm at Behavior. Behavior was founded in 1992 in Montreal. It's the largest independent developer and publisher in Canada. We have over 800 employees, if you don't know the size of Behavior yet. And we are also the developer of Dead by Daylight, the award-winning asymmetrical multiplayer game that was launched over five years ago. And after all those years, it is still growing. We also have other titles in development, but I cannot reveal anything at the moment. For that, we're going to have to wait a little bit more. Before diving in, a couple of words about myself. Uh, like many people, I guess, when growing up, I couldn't dream about working in video games because simply I was born in the early 70s and games were not made in Quebec at that time. They were made either in Japan or in the United States. So when the opportunity presented itself in 1995, I jumped on it. I was working for a promotion company and did some activities with Nintendo around the launch of the Virtual Boy. I don't know how many of you had the chance to play with the Virtual Boy like 26 years ago. Then in 96 and 97, I still I worked directly for Nintendo, still in promotion around the launch of the Nintendo 64. I remember receiving those big units at La Ronde Amusement Park with Super Mario 64 in Japanese because the game was not translated when we received it. Also did certain events with the WWE at the Montreal Forum and for the launch of GoldenEye in 97 in universities around Quebec and Ontario. And I can say that GoldenEye is probably the only game along with Tetris that I was really good at. Since then, it's been a constant decline for me. Then, a bit after, I heard about the arrival of this French company called Ubisoft. That was in 1997. I was very, very interested and in even more after learning that many of my friends joined them. So I started there in 1999. You see Gimo here because Gimo is a sister company who was taking care of all the distribution of games in Quebec. I then moved to another division in product development and uh, for peripherals, so joystick, gamepad, stuff like that. I did that for three years, which allowed me to travel the world and also to live overseas. After a two years break uh, of video game, I went back to UB in 2005 where I held many positions in marketing on some big titles, including Rainbow Six Vegas, the first Assassin's Creed, Avatar, and For Honor. I also spent some time as a director of communication and also a producer. So during the 20 years I've been at Gimo and Yubi, I had the privilege to touch many different aspects of the video game business, which allowed me to have a pretty good view of everything we do. And as I mentioned in my intro, since January, I am the head of brand marketing for Behavior Interactive. I often joke that I have two missions in gaming. The first one is to help gaming being recognized globally like movie or TV. My dream is that game developers will get invited to big shows to talk about their latest creation and get the recognition they deserve. I always find it sad when we launch a big game and our developers are nowhere to be seen on mainstream TV. We had the chance when we launched For Honor in 97 to be featured on Conan O'Brien alongside Tom Brady the week before the Super Bowl. It was all nice, but there was no developer there to really talk about the game. They were just messing around with the game, which was good, gave us good visibility. My second mission is truly to implement marketing as a key development role. And it's gonna be mostly the, the, the topic today, but not just in terms of a team that will market the game once the game is ready, but really as an interesting part of the team. So I guess that everybody can agree with my dream on point one, and today, I hope to convert a couple of people about my second point. So I entitled my talk, Big or Small, Marketing Must Be Part of Your Plan. So ab apart from the joke about my own physical transformation, I thought it was cute. Uh, the message is more that whatever the size of your studio, you should always think about marketing from the beginning. I gave a talk about a similar topic, I think it was eight or nine years ago at MIGS. And at the time, many people came to see me after telling me it was simple for me to say that because I was working in a big AAA studio with money to spend in marketing. Don't get me wrong, having money is great. But 
what I'm talking about today is more a change of philosophy, is having a seat at the table and really having marketing and developers to work closely together. So in my career, I encountered two different scenarios. The first one, I've been in a situation where I had a seat at the table and that was great because I could really interact with the creative director, with the art director and give my insight about the market. But I've also been in situations where marketing was informed of certain decisions taken without consideration the potential business success of the game, where marketing was not even invited to discuss this. Then you're being handed something and say, go sell it. So a lot of people won't see the value of having marketing in conception or pre-production. When they have a dollar to spend, they will use it on a programmer, a designer, or an artist. Marketing is often the last in line. Sometimes, even when there is a marketer involved early on, many people won't think about involving them in the core discussion around the creation of a game. For a lot of people, marketing equals to sell the game, but we do way more than that and we can contribute much more than this. So after all, having a marketer or not in the room won't stop you from making your game versus the programmer, the designer, or the artist. I cannot argue with that. However, not having a marketer can truly hurt the potential success of your game, and I assume that's what you want. So the biggest question I get when I talk about having marketing is very simple. Why? Why should you be there? Why should we talk to marketing in conception of a game? Well, today I'll do my best to answer this question around three angles. The global entertainment market, gaming itself, and at the micro level, when you develop your game. So when we look at entertainment, if someone was waking up, let's say from a 20 year coma, they would not recognize the entertainment landscape we live in. Like back in the days, you had movies, you had TVs, and you had games. The only crossover you would see was a pure license deal. Back in 2009, I experienced something different because things already changed. When I worked on Avatar, we were working closely with the filmmakers in the studio to make sure that the game was an addition to the movie experience and not just the same story being said in a different medium. But those three mediums, movie, TV, and games, were clearly separate in the way to consume them. You even rarely saw movie actors in TV series. I think the one of the oldest examples I remember was Kiefer Sutherland when he did 24. And it was one of the biggest TV series at that time. It was launched in 2001. It was also geographically segmented. Apart from the big American TV series and movies, you had very little knowledge of what was happening in other parts of the world. But now things are completely different. When you think about that, I think about the Casa de Papel or Money Ice, they call it in English, from Spain, or Lupin from France, or the latest phenomenon from South Korea with Squid Game. Those things were impossible back in the days. But actually, what would have happened is they would have taken the idea and read it with American actors. But now you can see the original directly on Netflix. So can we say the same in 2021? You see movie stars and series all the time. Maybe not on cable TV, but certainly on the streaming services. You see canceled TV shows like Designated Survivor or Lucifer getting a second life thanks to the streaming service who will order additional seasons. You see legendary game brands with series like Castlevania, The Witcher, Arcane with League of Legends, Resident Evil, Assassin's Creed that was announced during the summer. Now you have game developer who create series like Mythic Quest on Apple TV. And now you have Netflix that launched its own gaming service last week. So we're really going full circle in terms of integration of all those mediums. Over the past couple of years, people change how they consume entertainment. We have more and more cord cutters and the, pan the pandemic did accelerate that trend with movies coming out now almost immediately or very soon after on the streaming services. Big new movies can now be watched from the comfort of your living room. While this is great and very convenient, on a personal level, I must admit that I still prefer to go to the movie theater. I went to see Dune last week and it was much better on this big screen than on my living in my living room. So if 20 years ago, TV, movie, and games were all living in their bubbles, the least we can say now is that those three entertainment mediums are now heavily connected. We now have an entertainment offer that is getting bigger, more convenient for consumers, and much more interconnected. Back in the day, I needed three devices to consume all those media. I can do everything on my iPad now. 
The NPR connectivity should impact the development of your game and marketing. We'll be there to do the research of the competitive environment. Because if you think that your competitive environment as game developers is only the game market, I'm sorry, but you are mistaken. The market, the entertainment market is bigger than that. And we are all competing for the same time of the user. So what are the themes that will resonate? Why are we going to do some research? Like what's the key things right now? Is it pirates, uh, the environment, true crime, terrorism, space exploration? I got it. So why space exploration? Well, we saw with Amazon and Virgin in the past two months about space tourism. There's a Russian filmmaker who, film, um, who shot a movie in space. There was a documentary with four civilians who went to space with SpaceX. So what kind of impact will this have on en in entertainment? Remain to be seen. What are the big shows right now that attract people's interest? And beyond the shows, are we seeing trends in entertainment that will impact how we develop games? Certain topics that were very popular at one point but are no longer popular? I remember in gaming at one point, we had a bunch of World War II shooters, but it stopped because that kind of topic, people said, okay, we've seen it all. Now we're ready to move on. Are there brands that we can collaborate with? Like knowing your competitive environment is critical to the success of a product. And you need answers to those questions for your product to be relevant in today's market. There's nothing more frustrating than to have something interesting, but when it comes out, nobody is paying attention because the thing that you're talking about, people simply don't care about those. So for me, not looking for these answers is the equivalent of going in blind and hope that it will be successful. So now let's leave the movie behind and talk about the gaming industry. Again, the same person waking up from a 20 year coma. So I don't know how much experience that like, you all have in this room and how many people you've been working in games. But if we go 20 years ago, what did we have? Well, in 2001, the first Xbox was being launched. We knew that Microsoft had money, but we didn't really know what to expect apart from that. We thought there was a Sega Dreamcast before, but now it's like, can they succeed? I uh, assume he had the PlayStation 2. I remember waking up like at 3 a.m. to go at the Zillers and Promenade Saint Bruno on the South Shore to get one. And I even imported one from Japan at the time. Uh, Nintendo had the GameCube, and they were totally dominating the mobile market with the Game Boy Color and the Game Boy Advance. And we had PC gaming. Now, 20 years later, what do we see? Well, we have the top three. They're still there. The big three that I already mentioned, they launched a couple of consoles since then, but other giants stepped on the dance floor, like Apple, Google, Amazon, Epic, Valve, Tencent, NetEase. So all those people are coming in. You have a lot of big publishers, the Activision of this world, the EA, the Ubisoft, and a lot of independent studios created by a lot of my former colleagues. So that is great. So the ecosystem is bigger and bigger. So not only now we have a lot of new players with very deep pockets, but the gaming experience changed as well. So when I talk about that, it's all the gaming evolutions. Like who would have thought a couple of years ago that someone on Xbox could play against someone on PlayStation, that arenas would be filled for esports tournament, that games would be free to play, that you could play a game while still being in development, that people will watch other people play. The gaming business completely changed and is still evolving very fast. I'm sure you know all, all the things I just mentioned, but are you asking yourself the questions for your development? Let's talk crossplay, for example. How big is it? Should you go for it? Is the investment justified? Because deciding to go crossplay will have an impact on your development. You might need to drop other features to be able to implement the crossplay. Is that what you want? Esport. You see those big events and you dream about having your game on those stage. But is eSport going to be a thing for your game? Even if you have a multiplayer game, are you eSport compatible? Should you go for it? And if yes, are you going for money or for awareness? Because eSport, it's not just an event that you put together. eSport has an impact on your game design and on your balancing. When people can tolerate certain balancing issues when they play with their friends, if you put $100,000 on the table, people will no longer forgive you if there's a balancing issue. So you need to think about that. What's the best business model for your game? Is it free to play, half price, full price? If you decide to go free to play, 
it does impact your design and your monetization plan. You cannot wait until the very end and say, again, is it a $20 game? Is it free to play? No, because your design will not allow you to move on to a free to play if you're not ready from the get go. Like, should you launch on all platform or early access? Should you try to be in Game Pass or not? So those are all questions that a marketer will bring. It's also true for the type of games we are making. Back in the days, the borders between game genre were obvious. A shooter was a shooter. Action adventure was action adventure. And a puzzle was a puzzle game. But what's happening now? Like, you have some monster games that are blowing up those borders between genre. And you have other games that are being more niche in their experience. And now you even have classic games that incorporate some modern concept like Tetris 99 and Pac-Man 99, which I personally love because they're games from my youth, but still. And I'm not saying one is better than the other, don't get me wrong, but having marketing involved at that point will help you answer those questions and make educated choices. So I am not saying that marketing should decide for you. What I'm saying is, they will help you and will have the information you need to make those choices. So now let's move on to my third category, the game itself. So how can we help in the day-to-day -day for you? First and probably the most important thing is to know who the audience is. For a long time, we were not asking that question for a very simple reason. Developers and gamers were pretty much the same people. We were making game for ourselves and since the audience was homogeneous, it was very easy to target. But the gaming audience grew and changed dramatically in the past 20 years. So did the game makers. And I would say that game makers are not changing as fast as the audience. So we are probably not always the best judge when, it, when if we only rely on our opinion. Let's say you're a game designer with 10, 15 years of experience. So you're around what, mid 30? Well, breaking news, people that are 15 to 25 right now, they have different motivations and expectations that you have. And that was nice when I said mid-30s because I'm late 40 and I know a lot of designers who are about my age. So trust me when I say this, I have a 15-year-old daughter. My preoccupations in life are not the same as she does. So if we rely only on my opinion and opinion of people like me, that would be a very, very big mistake to do. Having a marketing team involved early on will also allow you to do some research. Check the market fit between the ideas, the concept, and the audience. Let me give you two examples. The first one is over 10 years ago, I was working on a game on the week, and the game designer pitched us an idea. As part of this pitch, he tried to incorporate some market info. And the result was, we should make this game because nobody else has done a game like that before. He was in search of this blue ocean. He was right. Nobody else has done it before, but for good reason. It was a blue ocean with no fish in it. He only took one part of the equation and did it check the market fit between his idea and the audience. The Wii was for big Nintendo fans and for family, but he was proposing a game that was successful only on PC at the time. So maybe it would have been a great game, but making a good game is not enough. This is not the fields of dream when they say, build it and they will come. No, you have to rely on actual market to develop a game. The second example is one we did for Honor and we were preparing for our big reveal at E3 2015. We, the marketing team, had done plenty of research on the audience, what would interest them and what would have the biggest impact. We were trying to find something special, something unique that would make people react strongly and allow our game to stand out. I was calling that what is our leap of faith in homage to Assassin's Creed. What is unique? We did biometric research to see where the emotions were spiking. So during our research, we found out that the executions were one of those things. So we went back to the team and said, look, executions are big. So when preparing the E3 demo, the team thought about how to incorporate executions to maximize the impact. So we were not only involved in the decision to put execution in, but also in the realization of the execution to make sure that we will match the consumer expectation based on our research. It was not gut feeling, it was backed up by some data. And I'll tell you exactly what the, the, the debate was. At one point in the demo, the knight, he was swinging his sword and chopping the head off of a samurai. So the debate was this, do we go for a one clean swing when the sword doesn't stop and the head goes off or while he swings, he encounters some resistance at this level. 
We chose the latter. We chose to encounter some resistance. We thought it would be more impactful. So you see, those are two examples where marketing played their role in advising a dev team in regarding the game content. So why is it important to have marketing? Well, when you make a game, you think about game mechanics, the art direction, the animation, the storyline, and that's all good. On our part, we'll think about how to package it, how to promote it, who the audience, how the audience will react. We can do those things in parallel. It's possible. I don't recommend it, but it's possible. Because if you do it together, you can benefit from each other. Because when we hear about certain features, it can impact our plan. And when you hear about our plan, you can decide to put certain features. You might have a jam in your game right now that you don't suspect. And maybe if someone in marketing sees it, they say, wait, what is this thing? That is super cool. I need that. I need that to market our game. So you should always think about that. There are some mechanics. And when you talk, let's say game design for a minute, there are some mechanics that you need in your game simply to exist in this genre. For example, if you work on a shooter, trying to change the core shooting mechanic might not be the best idea because you have major players out there who establish the standard. You have some features that are nice to have, but if you don't have them, it won't make much of a difference. And you have the features that will make you unique, that will make you different, and that will make you stand out. And our job in marketing is to broadcast, to amplify, to highlight the uniqueness of your game. In some occasions, certain features could become much bigger and more important if we work together to amplify them. So we talked about our marketing can help create a game by bringing some of our market insights. Now, let's look at how this early involvement can also contribute to the communication of the game. But first, there's a myth I would like to debunk, and it's the myth that having a good game is good enough. I met some developers who thought that having a good game was enough to ensure commercial success. Don't get me wrong, having a good game is important because if your game is bad, nothing will save you, especially in 2021. But with thousands of games available on Steam, for example, having a good game is not enough to stand out. I'm sure that someone in the room could give me an example. Hey, no, look at this game. They didn't do any marketing and they are successful. And it's okay. I expect that. But for me to rely solely on the quality of your game to be successful is like relying on the lottery to plan your retirement. Sure, some people will win at the Lotto 649, but the vast majority of us won't. So having a good game is not good enough. So now that I hope I managed to debunk that myth, let's move on. So let's talk about reciprocity. Since the beginning of my talk, I advocated that marketing involve, marketing should be involved from the beginning that we make a better game. So now I want to talk about the reciprocity. By working with the development team from the beginning, the marketers, people like me, will know the game inside out. We will know the why, the essence of the game. And living it with a dev team is not the same thing as reading it in a briefing document. We will know what's unique, like what the audience expect, what are the key stories to tell, what's the general threat in the market. And it will help us to develop a very strong branding around the game that is more in line with the proposal you are making. It's true for the name, for the game, for the name of the game, the logo, the key art, the announcement trailer. I am sure, because I've seen it, that some of you have been frustrated in the past when you saw the name of your game, when you saw the trailer that, the, that your marketer did, or the key art, like, this is not the game I'm making. Why is that happening? Well, this is a perfect example of a disconnect. Either the game is not matching an audience big enough and marketing is trying to compensate. I'm not saying that's what they need to do, but that's what they will do. So that's why working together will as much as possible avoid the, those problems. And when a collaboration is established early on, it will usually continue in the promotion phase of the game. As a marketer, I will always look for the developer's feedback. In what we do, are we capturing the essence or are we of what they're trying to create? Uh, the stories we build together, it will be much more powerful and genuine than if I just create something on my own. So now, myth number two that I want to debunk today is because once upon a time, marketing could create a smoke show. A strong license, a good ad campaign would have been enough for a game to sell. There was a couple of websites, there were a couple of websites were talking about games, but that was it. There was no influencer, no streamer, no social media. So... It's time to debunk the second myth. Marketing 
cannot can save a bad game. If you think that is true, this is a myth. Marketing will not be able to save you if the game is bad. It will fail. Like the audience is much more educated about gaming than they were before. They have what we call a very good BS meter and they will spot it from miles away. And if you cannot convince a core group of people who are highly informed to play your game, there's nothing I can do. Like two examples of how like core audience will impact with social media. Years and years ago, I was attending an event in LA and I was talking to someone from a movie studio. And that person was telling me that how they they used to be able to predict the weekend box office of a movie by only taking the Friday evening because they had a formula, something like if you do X on Friday, it's going to be 2X on Saturday and 1.5X on Sunday. But social media completely transformed that. And that was like three, four years after the arrival of Twitter, Facebook, and Reddit. So if something goes bad, it can have a really negative impact. Like one example for that, I'm sure you're about Eternals that came out last week. Well. I'm a fan of all those movies, superhero movies, but my social media have been super quiet, if not negative about the movie. So I'm way less in a rush to go see it. On the opposite side, if you take Fall Guys and Among Us last year, my Twitter timeline was blowing up. Everybody was playing it. So I followed the trend and I played the game as well. So this core group of people is really important because they will become the ambassadors of your game when you promote it. That's where you will see streamer emerge. They will defend your games if you encounter any problems, any difficulties, and you might encounter some. They will irradiate the people around them because if the core crumble, that's where you have a domino effect and that's where you will have a lot of problems. By working closely together, we will be able to create an ecosystem that will engage player around the game or the brand for the long term. A couple of minutes ago, I was talking about being genuine in the stories and being transparent is also a key element. After launching For Honor, we had tremendous connectivity issues and we had to change our entire online infrastructure. The game was launched in February 2017 and we implemented a dedicated server a year later. But thanks to our transparency, we managed to keep the core audience active. This was possible through collaboration between all the teams internally, but social media, live streams, influencers, game update. As I mentioned before, at the end of the day, whether we like it or not, we are fighting for their time. So if your game is not there, if you don't talk with them, people will just abandon you and they will go play something else, watch a movie or do any other things that they can do on the tip of their finger. So as you said today, like I'm close to the end, so I'm going to go soon to the Q&A. Like to develop and market games in 2021 is much more complex than it was 20, even 10 years ago. The general entertainment offer is bigger, more diversified, and more accessible. The gaming industry had ex exploded in terms of offers and possibility, and the audience is more knowledgeable, diverse, and demanding. So I want to leave you today on a final thought. Like as a gaming professional, I can have an opinion about game design or art direction, but it doesn't make me a designer or an artist. Marketing is an expertise. Everyone can have an opinion about it, but it doesn't make them expert. So thank you very much, everybody. And now I will go see if we have any questions. So I don't see any question right now in the Q&A or in the chat. So thank you, Vincent, for your comment. Very kind. Merci, Luc. So I don't have any question. So uh, thank you very much, everybody. If you want to hit me on Twitter, it's L Duchesne. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions over there uh, if you want to send some. Oh, 
Yes. Is there a limit when we have to rely on the marketing to create a game? Oh, yes, of course, there is a limit. Uh, there is a limit. Of course, you cannot. I would never say to, to take it for granted. I think it's a source of information that will be merged into the, the knowledge of the team. Like I would never advocate for uh, com relying completely on data. And that's, that's your, uh, your second question. Like I think relying entirely on data will actually take away the creative thinking that the team will have. So I think you need to look at the data to look at what could impact you or not. But I think it's very important. It, it's one of the elements. Like I will never again advocate for to take marketing entirely and and disregard every, anything else. So it's one source of info. I strongly encourage you to, uh, to use it. And sometimes you can have some blockers and it's the challenge will be to, to find them and to identify them. So from Rosemary, so as someone who is not a marketing expert by title, I can get a sense of the core of the job. Of a community like my, actually, as a community manager, you are in a very, I don't know if I get your question properly, but like the core of the job, a community manager for me, it's something, and I will be super honest. Uh, when I was an avatar, it's when I had the first community manager with me on my team. And I did not understand what they were doing. Not at all. That's like maybe in 2008. And uh, if I go on my 400 days, we had a couple of community developers who work with us and community managers. And I think that they are, you are central to the success of a game because you are the people in contact with the audience. And just like marketing, you will be able to bring part of your knowledge, part of, of what the people will think. But where I will moderate is sometimes people will rely a little bit too much on, on let's say on Reddit or on Twitter to get the feedback of the players. And I think it has to be calibrated a little bit to be able to, to have a proper view because it's not everybody who's on Twitter and, uh, and Reddit. So, but community managers, I think you are there. You can, you, you can bring information to, to the team. Uh, sometimes it can be entertainment information that you spotted that could have an impact on your game. Uh, so I think that's something uh, important for me. So if I ever encounter, <laughs> I've ever encountered any pushback on some marketing topics from the production team. Yes, uh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, how did you would approach the situation? Well, I think for me, the way to, to approach a situation is to try to find uh, partners, try to find people and cases. Sometimes it's a business case is to look at and try to bring concrete examples and data. Because again, opinion is an opinion. Uh, and that's what, that's what my final thought was about is I want people to rely on expertise and it's true for, for me, I need to respect the game designer expertise and I expect people to respect my marketing expertise. And it's not because it's not a technical skill that it's not a skill and it's not an expertise. So the way I approach it is to try to, to have a discussion, bring back facts, bring back, let's say the audience. Uh, I had situations where people say, oh no, we shouldn't do this trailer for X, Y, Z. I'm like, yeah, but why? Like right now, this is the kind of topic that we need to talk about to convince the audience. So it takes time. Like it's not something, it did not happen for me like overnight. Uh, it took some time. And at one point I reached that point where people were, I would say, believing me or were relying on what I would do. And I would try to also involve them in the process. We have a focus test, you invite the dev team. I remember a focus test in Cincinnati and, uh, the game is not important. And the, and the moderator asked, what do you want? And one of the guys said, I want guns. I'm like, okay, what else do you want? More guns. And then you have the creative director and producer sitting next to me and like, okay, what do I do with this? I'm like, okay, like focus test, but still it's important so they can see the audience. We can do the marketing and something like meeting. <sighs> Good question from Alexandre. Uh, would you include marketing in some design meetings or is it too deep within a production? It's, it depends. It really depends. I think not in every design meeting because that's, that's just not feasible for me. We have a job to do. But in certain design meetings, I think it can be interesting. On some, there are certain topics, like I talked about the E3 demo, 
and where when they were literally designing the demo and what was happening, the kind of moves we were doing. I was involved in that. I was in all of those meetings. But a lot of design meetings, I was not. But I had discussions after to make sure that I was aware. And I think you should intervene. Marketing should intervene when you spot a problem. If you see that something is problematic uh, for X, Y, Z reason, you envision that could become a PR nightmare, you have to intervene. Like not saying a word is not a solution for me. What's your usually process key step to figure out what the selling points of a game you're developing? That's a good one. Like usually I will start from the vision of the game because we will go and test the vision. And it starts from there. If you don't start from the core of your product, you will not sell the product. So what I would do is I will go in, I will test the vision of the game. And by hearing people talk and how they will react on the certain features, that's how you will say, okay, this one can work, this one won't work. And what are the different levers you can use to really have uh, success? So that's how we do it. That's the initial process. And then once you, uh, in French, we say défricher. I don't know how you say that in English. Uh, when you clear that out, you have a couple of ideas. That's when you go and you move on to maybe a game positioning where you try to put in a sentence what's the essence of your experience. And the positioning for me is super important because that's the backbone of everything you'll do moving on. So that is why, like, and when you test that, you test some reasons to believe, like why is your positioning true? And then by looking at those things, you can see a little bit more. It, you can move the needles. Okay, this positioning, I thought it was good, but it's not. Like the players don't react well to it. So it's how, uh, it's how we do that. I don't know if I missed anyone. Uh, <laughs> Hello, Rose, one of my colleagues. Uh, what do you think is the most effective cost effective budget related to marketing for typical game dev. Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> and Mariev, so thank you to my to both of my colleagues. Uh, it, it will depend. It will depend if you're launching a new IP, you need to spend more. Uh, I would say below 10%, you can be limited. Uh, if you have a new IP, it can be more than that because you will need to create awareness. And when you think about marketing and about any product, the first step is awareness. People need to know that you exist. And if they don't know you exist, and the way to know that is by investing. So that is where when you create something new, you might need to put a little bit more money so people will know about it. When a game is well established, that's when you can sometimes target your money a little bit elsewhere, but there's no, I would say golden rules on how much, is it five, is it 10, is it 20%. I'm always careful about not digging a hole too deep, especially if you have an experience that is too different because then it's very difficult to get out of your hole. Trying to see if I have others. So we have four minutes left on the countdown here. If I might have time for one more question. Two, if I speak fast, which I think I do, and I apologize if I spoke too fast. Okay. So I think there's nothing else happening here on q a so i don't know if we are all done for questions but then again like don't don't be afraid to hit me up i'll be i'll be more than happy to to answer questions if i have the answers obviously Merci.